finally, we will close the day with the last guy, Ronnie Burkett. Ronnie Burkett's a guy who can make you believe that the puppets that you are watching him manipulate are real. I uh, caught Ronnie's uh, character happy uh, a couple of years ago in Edmonton and have been trying very hard ever since to get Ronnie to join us. And finally, today, he has agreed. So, that is Come on up here, Ronnie. Hi. So you've got your biography of Ronnie Burkett. Thanks. It's uh, oh. <laughs> green light. Uh, it's wild to be in a room where I know that none of you know what the heck I do. Um, <laughs> but that's actually been my whole life because uh, I'm 45 now. I'm telling you that just to give you some information that I've been on the road since I was 14 as a puppeteer. And uh, my father used to. Uh, put my puppet shows in the car and drive me around Alberta for those lucrative $50 gigs because I didn't have a driver's license at that time. And I've just been on the road ever since. So my life is actually one of standing in front of strangers every night. And it's always opening night, even though I get to stand on this or other stages for several hundred nights of every year. Um, I kind of knew that was coming. And I actually had a little anxiety attack this afternoon, and I went off and I missed uh, one of the sessions because I was listening this morning and I thought, I haven't been to Afghanistan. <laughs> and then I thought, I haven't overcome a disability. <laughs> Unless you consider brown hair a disability, which I do. Um, thank you. I'm here all week. Um, and I thought, well, what the heck am I doing here? And then I thought, where are your puppets? I didn't bring any of the puppets. Where's your AV? I didn't bring any AV. Where are your pictures? I so I, I actually took Moses seriously when he said, what are you thinking about? What's an idea? What makes you go? What's made you go so far? And I actually thought, what a wonderful thing to do to come and not have to sing for my supper and bring the damn puppets and jiggle them around. So I didn't. But I think Moses wanted me to. <laughs> So I took him seriously, and I've been racking my brain for, I was on tour overseas for six weeks, and I rack my brain every day thinking, today I will write what I'm going to talk about at that thing, and then I get another idea, and then I get another idea. As these things go in my life, every day I get 15 more ideas. And last night at 3 in the morning, I went, I know what I want to talk about. Now I know what I'm passionate about. And I woke up this morning not that passionate about that. So anyway. <laughs> um, I'm talking about being here. I am here. So I want to tell you some stuff. When I was seven years old, the world book fell open. Um, it was the P volume, by the way. It fell open to puppets. And I looked at this picture of a guy with puppets, and I said, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I closed the book. Now, had it fallen open to proctologists, I'd be looking at you all from a completely different angle right now. <laughs> for money. Um, but <laughs> thank you. I didn't know if the bum joke could get a laugh, you know? <laughs> so. I have been captivated by this muse since the age of seven, and um, she has not let go of me. And it wasn't so much that I wanted to play with dolls, or that I wanted to hide behind things, or that I wanted to control the world, which are all really stock answers for a puppeteer, I guess. Control freak, hiding freak. Um, <laughs> What puppetry gave me as a child, who was essentially a loner, it was a way to shrink that out there, which relates to how we started this morning. Um, and it relates to why I continue doing my work, and I actually embrace it and love it more, because I don't understand that out there. I'm glad some of you do, and can come and explain it to me, and write it down, and I read you every day, and I listen to news, and I talk to people, but I still can't always make sense of stuff. But if I can shrink it, and examine it smaller, and then present it to an audience and say, here's what I think, what do you think? Somewhere in this inanimate form of theater, we're discussing humanity. And when I realized that about a decade ago, that I actually was doing a kind of theater uh, which was about humanity and there were no humans in it, it was staggering to me. And that led me on a journey of, what is this about? You know, there is some theater, there is some theater where it happens up here, and you can actually have your cell phones ring, and you can chew your apple in the back, and you can whisper to one another, and it doesn't affect the show because everybody's mic'd, and it's the same show, and it's not the person on stage. It's not their creation, it's their job. Um, for me, it is 
my creation and my interpretation, which I hope I have time to tell you about. But um, it, it is a wild thing that I've been experimenting with, this vocabulary of the theater, which is I do my work here with no fourth wall, you do your work out there, and somewhere, by my controlling your breathing and by making you focus down on these little things that my whole goal is you will care about them. You may not agree with them, but you will care about them. And if you do, when that character is about to reveal something, all I have to do is lower my voice. See? You shut up. And then you start breathing for the character. So that's what I do, is I control people's breathing, and I jiggle things around, and I talk for two and a half hours, and don't give people intermissions, and all of that stuff. But that's what I've learned my job is, is to captivate your breath so you can give life to something that has none. Um, it's a fascinating job. What, I, what I'm exploring right now in my the idea that I came here with, Moses, was that uh, there's a whole big debate amongst artists, and I think this could happen in business or science or whatever. Uh, it's just my little world are artists talking about which is better, the creative artist or the interpretive artist. You know, it, it's someone who creates fresh, brand new, original material superior to someone who takes standards or Shakespeare or jazz tunes or eh, and reinterprets them. Well, I think, you know, when you start that discussion, of course, the creative artists are all going, we're better because we thought it up, you know? We don't have to rely on a, a canon of existing material. And, and I, I think I kind of veered that way for a while, but the, the thing is, I do create everything. There is, I don't go to Muppet Depot and buy my stuff, you know? <laughs> you know? Christ, but, but uh, <laughs> Everything I think of, everything I write in these plays has to be built, you know, every little chair and shoe and, eh, and the scenery, and, and it adds up to tons and tons of stuff which gets shipped around the world for these shows, but none of it exists until I think of it. Um, then I have the great luxury, you see, of not only being this creative guy, but then for a couple of years, for hundreds of performances, I go and interpret my own work. So I stand on stage and I say my own words every night, getting you guys to breathe with me. And so what I've learned is that the constant act of repetition is where the artistry lies. You know, when I was younger, I, w I wanted to make a puppet, do it, show off, get the applause, and make something new, you know? And now, I actually love the repetition of my job. I love taking the same play that started in Calgary or Edmonton or Toronto and then going to Sweden and going, <laughs> they won't understand a word I'm saying. And they actually speak better English than Calgarians, you know? <laughs> And so the interpretation changes, you know? So I want to tell you very quickly about this trilogy that I've just finished because I, I feel like I'm ending a big phase of my life and beginning a new one. And, and so I'm kind of in the middle of this idea. Um, in 1984, I started a trilogy of work and I didn't know it was a trilogy. I started this one play. I had been called the bad boy of puppetry. I could have, by this age, had I kept going that way, been the Siegfried and Roy of puppetry. You know, big face lift and I could keep going. You know, I was, <laughs> oh, I was cheeky and I was brash. <laughs> Screw looking at the puppets, look at me, you know. <laughs> Watch me breathe for a change. And that's how it was. And there were big musicals and they were body and they were tongue in cheek and I was naughty. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, I kind of realized I'm neither a boy nor bad anymore. You know, I'm actually okay, and I like what I do. And, but I was still in this cheeky vein, and one day I was looking through a puppet book that I'd had my whole life, but it fell open again, and I read this little thing. It was one paragraph talking about uh, Czech puppeteers who did underground, show, underground shows during the Nazi occupation of their country during the Second World War. And these shows were called daisies, because apparently a daisy can grow in the dark. And these were beacons of hope to people who found these shows because they were imperceptible to the Nazi censors initially. And, but uh, over time, 100 Czech puppeteers and writers for puppet theater were sent to the camps because they were puppeteers. And that changed my life in that moment because I realized that I was in a time of, I did a lot of this kind of work for money. I made a lot of money doing children's television, you know a lot of money, and, and, and I was part of the Muppet generation of puppeteers, and, and everybody was gonna get their own TV series, and we were all gonna make foam latex this and rubber that, and, and I read this thing and I went, oh my God, thank you for telling me there's some nobility in my craft within the century I'm 
was living it then, you know, in the last century. And I thought, I have, to, I have to tell people about this. I have to honor those puppeteers who went underground and who died and who did these shows called Daisies that Czech people actually found in basements and darkened theaters and it gave them hope. And I thought, a puppet show giving someone hope? I, I can't believe that. So I stopped what I was doing. I stopped my career. I stopped the way I designed puppets. I, I wrote a play. And, and then I designed it in a whole new way. And I did it for me and I thought, this will end my career but I'm going to tell this story. And it became the most successful thing I ever did. It became a miracle to me that I've been doing since 94, actually, and I finally, I finally had to decide to retire it in October. It, it, the last tour is October because I could do it for the rest of my life, but it's about a young puppeteer going underground and fighting against his mentor, and he eventually gets sent to the camps, and, and, and I thought, 50 playing a young protege. You know, that's getting a bit long in the tooth, so it will retire. So the next play, Th that was inspired. While we were building Tinka's new dress, I feel obliged to stand and keep an eye on the green light. While we were building Tinka's new dress, there was a CBC radio show. I think it might have been Morningside. Um, uh, was on the radio in my shop, and I think the costumer and I were there, and they were talking about the blood scandal, the tainted blood scandal, and there was some guy on the panel, you might be here today, I don't know, and he kept saying, clean blood, clean blood, like a mantra, and I, I turned to my costumer, Kim, and I said, you know, it's funny, you know, the, the currency isn't going to be worth anything in the future. The person who will have power will be the person who controls the blood supply. And she said, who would that be? And I said, why, it would be a group of vampires touring a new musical and overdraining their victims to finance it, you know? <laughs> and that's where Street of Blood began. I thought it was going to be a return to Bad Boy. You know, I was going to do this musical about a bunch of vampires sucking the life out of everybody and selling off the blood to finance the show, which was a touring musical based on the life of the Virgin Mary called Oh Mary. Um, <laughs> but starting that work, suddenly I started thinking about blood and I thought about what makes a family? Biology? Is that what makes a family? Is that what makes... I, I'm adopted, so I started thinking about that, you know? I started thinking about all kinds of blood issues, and of course, blood of Christ came into it. Um, and I thought, okay, what if a woman is quilting and she pricks her finger and she bleeds on her quilting and sees the face of Christ in the Shroud of Turnip Corners, Alberta, it appears, and then, then the vampire showgirl shows up. <laughs> And then her karaoke singing gay son who blows up gay bars to make it look like the Christian right did it. What if he showed up and then Christ appears to all three and that's Street of Blood. And when I wrote it, I sat on my studio couch one night sobbing my eyes out going, this will end my career. <laughs> and that became very, very popular and broke box office records all across the country at theaters and, and got me a Chalmers Award. And I, I don't say that to brag, I say that a puppeteer got his second Chalmers Award as a playwright. That's not supposed to happen. I was a puppeteer. I am a puppeteer. Suddenly people say, oh, you're an actor, oh, you're a playwright, oh, you're a designer, or you're a producer. And I go, okay, whatever, I am. <laughs> so we're building Street of Blood. And when Street of Blood is being built, and I'm at YPT doing the only kid show I ever did with marionettes, but, um, you know, I'm outside smoking. And we find out that, um, that a friend of ours in the theater had died at the age of 34 of, a, of an aneurysm. He died like that. And his wife, for six weeks, tried many times to kill herself and succeeded in the sixth week. And we were talking at the stage door about these people who were loved in the theater community. And I said, what is this thing about happiness? I mean, who gets to be happy? Is it a gift just a few people are given or is it something you have to strive for every day? Is it is a job to be happy? What is this? And I looked at my stage manager and the composer and everybody went, Oh, I got another show, here we go. <laughs> and that was how Happy was born. I didn't want a third show. And that's how Happy was born. And Happy is an exploration of grief and, and what it takes. And why, for some people, grief is this thing that puts you immediately down into hell. Forget Kubler-Ross and her damn stages. You don't want to go through them, you go right to hell. And for other people, it's this wall you just keep hitting over and over and over and over and over again. And why are there some people who, when presented with grief and tragedy, and great despair will climb up over that wall. Because that's what I want to be. So I had to write it down. And I was at a point in my own life where I didn't know if I'd ever get to be really happy. I didn't know if I'd ever get the love of my life. And I wanted to write a play about it, about two characters that were so in love, there was no life without the other one. And then I thought, well, okay, just so you know, these things are really funny, too. Um, <laughs> 
And I thought, how am I going to make happy funny because there's like, you know, this guy dies and then there's a suicide and there's all these old people in a rooming house. And, and I thought, what if we had a parallel universe which was the Grey Cabaret, which is this grief vaudeville based upon Kubler-Ross's five stages of, of death and dying. And I thought, that's a great vaudeville, you know. Um, <laughs> not that I actually personally agree with those five stages. I, I think perhaps there's one way to grieve, or ten ways, or thousands, depending on you. But I thought we all know those five stages of, you know, um, anger, denial, all of that stuff. So why not use it as a context for this? So we had this guy named Antoine Marionette, who was the host of the Grey Cabaret, and he presented, you know, um, uh, Jacqueline Duprest, a cello player for depression, <laughs> and a Punch and Judy show for anger, and uh, Maureen Massey Ferguson, the opera singer, singing a song about denial, and, and, and so it was really sick and funny, I thought. Um, <laughs> Robert Cushman didn't, but um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so that's where these things come from, and I've got my little yellow light. So I want to tell you very quickly right now, that trilogy of grief and longing and sadness and weirdness is over, and I thought, what do I want to talk about now? And I want to talk about beauty. I want to talk about what we do to touch it or possess it or, God forbid, become it, and if we can't have it, what we do to, pos to destroy it, to kill it. And so it's a, it's a play. Uh, about the last century told through the eyes of a painting. Because at this point in my life, having been on the road so many years and, and, and standing on the stage so often, I'm aware that I'm looked at a lot, but then I leave town. And then I'm looked at a lot and then I leave that town, you know? And, uh, and I thought, what would it be like to comment on the audience out there? So that's what it is. And the last line I can't wait to say, I can't wait to have this thing built and produced and uh, premiered, so I can look at an audience in the last line of the play and say, ah, beautiful, there you are, all of you. Because that's what an audience is to me. And I will tell you, I could talk for hours, but I want to tell you my one little thing that keeps me going. And this just happened last year. Some nights I look up there where those lights are that kind of blind me, and I see floaters in my contact lenses. <laughs> but I swear to you, to me, that is the light of heaven. And I have a privileged life being able to stand on a stage and breathe with people because so many people come to the theater now hungry for one thing. Everyone has email and their cell phones and pagers, and we're all hooked up in digital. And I've noticed in the last five years an audience that is longing for the acoustic voice to stand and talk to them about something. Not the big shows, not the big hits. You can go to every city and see. But, but an audience that does find their way into the theater with their shoes on and their coats and they've turned the TV off and they come and they sit and they will breathe with you. And there is nothing better than feeling the breath of your species every night. So thank you, and thank you, Moses, very much. Hello, hello, Ronnie. Right, right, right. Thank you so very much. Now we can do it, right? Yes, we can. <laughs> Ronnie, Ronnie, I. I know, I know this is not entirely fair, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't give a damn. Um, <laughs> I, I want to ask you, in the presence of all your fans, whether you will come back next year and so bring your City? puppets. Yes. Are you doing it at the same time of year? Uh, yeah, almost the identical dates, right? 18, 19, 20, June, next year, same time, same place. And am I right when we all breathe together, mm -hmm. that's a conspiracy. <laughs> I'll do anything for the new I'm All right. right.